Welcome to today's American Security Project webinar. This is an on-the-record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, I will turn it over to ASP CEO, Patrick Costello. Thank you, Matthew. Good afternoon from Washington. Welcome to today's virtual meeting. State hostage taking for geopolitical purposes is part of an increasingly complicated threat matrix in international affairs. Since the early 2010s, US citizens have increasingly been taken hostage. There are nation states detaining individuals, as is the case in the news today with Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan in Russia. But it's not just Russia. According to the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation, the current number of publicly disclosed hostage and wrongful detention cases is 67 in nearly two dozen countries. There's also the matter of terrorist groups, militant groups taking hostages. This is a challenge from Afghanistan to Syria and the Niger Delta to Southeast Asia. This is such a complicated matter that the Obama administration thought it necessary to create the position of a presidential special envoy for hostage affairs. Joining us this afternoon to discuss coercive kidnapping, wrongful imprisonment, and political hostage taking is an old friend, Dr. Danny Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert is a Rosenwald Fellow in U.S. Foreign Policy and International Security at the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute at the U.S. Military Academy. She has been widely published in leading foreign policy and national security academic journals. Her research explores the causes and consequences of hostage taking in international security, and her current book project examines why and how armed groups kidnap during civil war. To our guests on the line, as mentioned at the top, throughout this afternoon's conversation, please feel free to use the chat and Q&A functions to submit your questions, and I'll weave them in. If you'd like to be identified with your affiliation, please provide that as well. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Let's get right into it. So wrongful detention and political hostage taking has certainly been in the news cycle a lot recently with the potential U.S. Russia trade for Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan for Victor Bout, but uh, this isn't a new issue, uh, and it's actually unfortunately somewhat common. My understanding is that there has been a rise in foreign governments uh, wrongfully detaining Americans to exact concessions, policy changes, prisoner exchanges. It seems like it's a low form of asymmetric warfare for countries wishing to poke the bear without provoking a full-on retaliatory strike. When ordinary citizens are almost being used as pawns in a three-dimensional game of geopolitical chess. But there's also a real risk posed by terrorists and militant groups and other groups. So can you just give us a bit of historical perspective on how this challenge has evolved over time, uh, the nation states that are increasingly using this uh, tactic as a diplomatic tool, as well as the threats from non-state actors. So essentially, just give us a sense of the history and the current threat landscape. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me, Patrick, and uh, it's wonderful to be with you today. And the, the summary that you gave is exactly right. So over the course of the United States history, hostage taking has long been a problem for national security and foreign policy. But the form that that hostage taking has taken throughout the decades has really shifted. So in the 1960s and 70s, that looked like airplane hijackings. Then there were embassy sieges all over the world used as hostage takings. In the 1980s, it shifted to kidnapping by non-state groups like rebels, terrorists, uh, criminals, paramilitaries. And that trend really was the dominant type of hostage taking from the 1980s until about 10 years ago. So uh, right around 10 years ago is when the Islamic State was on the rise, was kidnapping and beheading Westerners, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, those are some of the most prominent kidnapping groups of Americans abroad, while uh, rebel groups in Latin America were really famous for kidnapping in their own civil wars. But about 10 years ago, the trend really shifted away from these non-state actors and towards state hostage takers. So during the Trump administration, well, 
let's take it back. During the Obama administration, there were, as some Americans arrested, what we would now call a wrongful detention, arrested abroad and used for leverage in geopolitical exchanges. So um, a case that I know is quite familiar to your organization, Alan Gross in Cuba was arrested in what the United States might now consider a wrongful detention and was ultimately exchanged as part of a prisoner swap and larger set of uh, economic and geopolitical concessions. That really increased uh, from the end of the Obama administration throughout the Trump administration to today, when right now there are more Americans being held wrongfully by states than there are, as far as we know, being held by non-state actors. And so during that time, the worst perpetrators have been Iran, uh, Venezuela, Russia and China, arresting not just Americans, but uh, citizens from democracies all over the world. And some other states that have arrested Americans wrongfully include North Korea, uh, Burma or Myanmar, um, uh, Egypt, Syria, and Turkey. And so this has really been a rising trend and it's hit the mainstream attention of American citizens with the recent arrest of Brittany Griner in Russia. Great, thanks. It, so this trade has been in the news a lot, uh, and it's rightfully getting a lot of attention. Um, but it seems to me like there's there are risks that trades such as what's being contemplated could potentially incentivize the detention of more Americans abroad by foreign actors looking to exact concessions. So just tell us a bit about that tension in the system. Sure. So when Americans are taken hostage or held wrongfully abroad, often the hostage taker will either make explicit or implicit demands of what it will take to get that person out of captivity. One thing we know about making concessions is that it works. It brings people home, it frees them. So offering a prisoner trade is a surefire way to bring Americans home. The problem with making these concessions is that it then advertises to our adversaries all around the world that if you arrest an American on these kinds of charges, that the United States government and our allied governments around the world are willing to give up uh, not only prisoners that we might want uh, have real strong national security reasons for keeping in prison, but also other kinds of economic, political concessions, diplomatic concessions that are uh, very difficult for, for the country to give up. There's a real debate about this incentive piece. This is a really difficult phenomenon to measure empirically and to know for sure. There's limited research on how concessions affect future hostage taking. There's some excellent peer reviewed scholarship that suggests that making concessions does increase the future incidence rate of kidnappings by terrorist groups, for instance. Um, but another thing we know on the flip side of this is that refusing concessions has failed to stop hostage taking. And so there's, there's a real risk here. During the last 10 years, these cases have not only increased in number, they've become much more public. Part of that might be that now we have terminology for it. We call it a wrongful detention or we call it hostage diplomacy. And so now there's a term, we can label these cases, we can uh, list them and the advocacy organizations, including the Foley Foundation that work on these cases have, have been keeping track. Um, but they might also be increasing because our adversaries are learning that this is very successful, that all they have to do is arrest an American on these trumped up charges and they will get what they want. Okay. so. That's on the nation state side. You've got this this coverage of Blinken talking to uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergey Lavrov to try and and put the pieces in motion for this this potential trade. Let's talk about the non-state actor side. So I believe it is stated U.S. policy that we do not negotiate with terrorists. Correct. So it's uh, it's very complicated um, what the U.S. will and won't do. So the Official US policy does not prohibit negotiation. It actually encourages negotiation. Conversation is, is always great, no matter who is uh, holding an American hostage. The only concessions that are prohibited are direct monetary payments from the US government to designated foreign terrorist organizations. So when we hear the US doesn't make concessions, it really means only that. The US government will not give money to an armed group 
that the US government has designated as a terrorist actor. And that's because it violates a law. It would be material support for a terrorist organization to pay money directly to a terrorist group. But in so many other cases, either the US government is willing to make kinds of concessions or to facilitate con uh, concessions in the private sector. So for example, the US government will make prisoner swaps uh, with armed organizations. Uh, Bo Bergdahl was a US soldier who walked off his base and pretty infamously was ultimately traded in exchange for five senior Taliban officials held at Guantanamo. For instance, um, the US has no prohibition on making concessions of any sort, whether that's monetary um, or diplomatic to state actors. And so when we talk about a no concessions policy, I understand there is obviously an assumption that that is the policy. Presidents have been saying it for decades, but it's only true in a very narrow slice of cases. All right. Now, an additional complicating factor here is you have uh, tension between families who are in a state of crisis wanting to get their loved ones home. You have policy objectives from the executive branch. And now you throw in an additional variable of members of Congress and you uh, advocating on behalf of their constituents, pressuring the executive branch. And this is a really complicated, intense situation. So you've worked on Capitol Hill. That's how we first met. Uh, and you've advised Congress on this issue. And I'm sure you've had deep discussions with people in the executive branch, whether it's the State Department or, or the White House. So can you just talk about how they navigate this really thorny challenge? Sure. So I bring two sets of experience and knowledge when I think about all these different actors involved in, in these cases. And one is my experience previously working on the Hill and knowing what it's like to support a member of Congress, to support a specific constituency, your district, and, and all the things that you have to do there. The other set is uh, my trainings as a negotiations instructor. So um, in my role at the U.S. Air Force Academy, I teach a class on the principles of negotiation. And one of the things that uh, you learn in the class on the principles of negotiation is how complicated negotiations get when there are multiple actors involved, but also that every actor brings its own set of interests to the table. And that the most important thing to do is find the common set of interests, even though they won't be completely overlapping. So there is one really central important interest that everybody shares in these cases. And that's the White House, that's the State Department, that's the members of Congress, that's the families. And that interest is bringing the American citizen home as quickly and as painlessly as possible. And so everybody shares that interest. And so the most that all the actors involved can do to kind of share the importance of that priority, the, the better the conversations will be. But that is the sole priority of the families, right? That all they want is to bring their loved ones home. They don't have to think about broader US foreign policy. They don't have to think about getting elected in, in the next election cycle. Uh, members of Congress have their um, constituency politics to worry about, whether advocating for a certain case is going to be helpful to them, uh, looking like they're doing good constituent services, but it might also um, be very difficult for them to advocate in a certain case. There are some hostages and detainees who are more sympathetic to the American public than others. And that involves the circumstances under which that person was arrested. Uh, some of my research shows that that can also be based on things like race and whether the person was a dual national, why they were in the dangerous place to begin with. And so that can be something that members of Congress think about as well. The White House and the State Department have a whole set of uh, national security and foreign policy interests that the member of Congress might have as well. They might be worried about incentivizing future attacks like we just talked about. They might regardless of what happens in the future, not in that moment want to reward an adversary for egregious behavior. And the states that are taking our citizens hostage are our natural adversaries. These are not our allies here. And so the conversations are extremely difficult. So 
I always think it's really important to keep all of that in mind. I think it makes a lot of sense for the families to advocate as strongly and as loudly as they want to. It's their prerogative to pressure their member of Congress to get involved and their prerogative to pressure the White House to do everything it can. But the White House will also have the interest in keeping this quiet, not just because of public controversy, but because quiet might facilitate a better outcome in the negotiation. So this is a problem that's getting worse, not better. So let's talk a bit about policy and policy remedies. So do you have any ideas on how to enhance the efficacy of the Magnitsky Act or the efforts of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention or any ideas on how to increase the effectiveness of the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs operation? Mm. So um, just very briefly on the, the special presidential envoy. So that goes by the acronym SPIHA. I'll just say that to save some words. Um, so the SPIHA was initially created in 2015 when the Obama administration did an update on its hostage recovery policy. And that 2015 policy change was mostly focused on kidnapping by non-state actors. The Obama uh, hostage policy review also created an interagency body based at the FBI that worked on operational level hostage recovery missions. But in 2015, they created this position at the State Department that was meant to raise the diplomatic profile of Americans kidnapped abroad in diplomatic conversations uh, with our allies and adversaries around the world. But the SPIHA, when created, was also given the power to weigh in on uh, in the text of the executive order, wrongful detention cases. So all of that was a bit unclear in 2015, even though we had Americans at that point who were wrongfully detained uh, in Iran, most notably. Um, and so a couple of years ago, several members of Congress um, wrote a bill that has uh, that was passed in 2020 that's called the Robert Levinson Hostage Recovery and Hostage Taking Accountability Act. And the Robert Levinson Act, which was named for an American who went missing in Iran in 2007 and is now uh, presumed dead, um, these members of Congress wanted to honor his memory and wanted to shore up U.S. policy to work on these cases. And so the Robert Levinson Act codifies into law the Obama executive order provisions, including the hostage recovery fusion cell and the SPIHA office. And then the law did two uh, things that have become really recent in the Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan cases and in the news of recent months. The Levinson Act first uh, laid out the list of criteria whereby the State Department might classify an international arrest as a wrongful detention. Wrongful detention is therefore an official legal category. It's not just a, a term that I'm using. And it sets out all kinds of criteria from maybe the American is being held for leverage or they were arrested because they were an American, all the way to questions um, about the foreign country's legitimacy of their legal system or whether the American is being treated fairly in prison. So uh, the Levinson Act laid out these criteria. And so now we're seeing uh, international uh, detentions being labeled under this, this label. So not only do they get the label, it means that their case is moved from the Consular Affairs Bureau at the State Department and placed under the SPIHA's purview, which means that the US government has decided it's not gonna just sit back, it's gonna get involved in making uh, deals in offering negotiations to, to get these people home. So one of the things that the Levinson Act really shows us is the importance of having these definitions. So one of the things that is currently really unclear is how we know when, a, when one of these cases is a wrongful detention, how we know whether it is a hostage taking, especially because our foreign adversaries sometimes, but not always, make their demands explicit. Sometimes they are just implied. And you only know that, that the thing that the United States or other governments has given up was what the foreign government wanted when they release our, our citizens in exchange. So there's an international convention uh, passed in the UN General Assembly in 1979, the International Convention Against the Taking of Hostages, that lays out a definition of hostage taking. And it's fairly clear that this phenomenon that I refer to as hostage diplomacy would 
potentially fit under the convention. But I think a new international definition of this is needed. How do we know when we're seeing one of these cases? How do we know when a detention is in fact wrongful and that therefore it counts as hostage taking? It counts as one of these uh, unlawful detentions and that therefore it is a violation of international law. So I think one of the most important next steps, both for the Biden administration and working with our allies and international bodies is to be really clear about those definitions because only once we have a clear understanding of what it is we're tackling, can they lay out the next steps to tackle it more effectively. So building on this, conversation on international norms and international behaviors. Secretary Blinken has said publicly that he wants countries to work together to establish norms that prohibit arbitrary detention of citizens for political purposes. And he envisions some type of global ban similar to the one on chemical weapons that grew out of World War I. So mm -hmm. can you discuss any current efforts to craft a global convention? Personally, I see little prospects for success. Russia and China are some of the main problems here but you also have countries like Iran and North Korea and Venezuela, which are already under sanctions and unlikely to be deterred or impressed as they routinely operate outside of the norms of international behavior. It's incredibly tricky and the international system and a, a system of sovereign states does not work in our favor here, right? Um, states are empowered to do with their criminal justice systems within their borders, whatever they, you know, to some extent, they have a lot of control over their own laws and what they can do. And so it's a really difficult avenue for cooperation. Russia and China, you know, on the permanent members, veto members of the UN Security Council um, are two of the biggest perpetrators of, of this phenomenon, at least according to the United States. Interestingly enough, they would turn right back at us and say that we do the same thing. And so there is an element of um, plausible deniability of hypocrisy that's kind of baked into the system here that, that makes this quite difficult. Canada, faced a very difficult uh, similar situation over the past few years. Um, they, uh, Canada arrested the CFO of Huawei, Meng Wanzhou, on an extradition request from the United States back in 2018. And just a couple of days later, uh, the Chinese arrested two Canadian citizens working in, uh, sorry, two Canadian citizens working in China, um, the, the two Michaels, as they are called, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, um, who were held um, often in solitary confinement, didn't have access to consular services, just a really egregious treatment during their arrests. And when the United States reached a deferred prosecution agreement, essentially to release Meng Wanzhou from her house arrest in Vancouver upon admission of guilt. Um, the Michaels were released, you know, hours later. So pretty clear, clear case of, of what I would call hostage diplomacy. The Canadian government has been leading a charge to, to really deal with this. And so they have put together a declaration against um, unlawful state detention. There are, I believe, 69 uh, national signatories to this moment. It's basically states saying, we're targets of this and we want to deal with it. Um, and an agreement to work together to research possible options to, uh, to prohibit it, to, to move it forward. So there's at least a basis of states that are committed to working on this issue that have recognized that it's a problem. Um, I think Canada is a, is a really obvious ally for the United States to continue working on this. Another really obvious ally for the United States is the UK. Um, so there have been several British citizens under very similar uh, uh, wrongful detention and hostage diplomacy cases recently. Um, most famously, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, um, who was arrested in Iran and, and released after six years of imprisonment. And the uh, UK Parliament, House of Commons, has been launching an, an inquiry into how well the government did or didn't do in this case and what they should be doing going forward. So I think there's similar efforts happening in a lot of our allied states and a real opportunity for the United States to, to rally these countries together and to figure out a path forward. Great, thanks. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the role of the military. We've, we've spent a good amount of time talking about the diplomatic tools, but let's talk about the military tools. Now, Robert O'Brien, who served as President Trump's hostage envoy and later as National Security Advisor, has been quoted in the Washington Post as saying that the first resort is a military rescue. Now that 
maybe best for terrorists or militant groups taking U.S. nationals hostage, but I think that's actually quite uh, quite risky if a nation state wrongfully detains American citizens where uh, rescue and evacuation plans are harder to justify and there's a real escalatory risk. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so first of all, I'll say I'm frankly very surprised that he would say that because um, rescue missions have never been the option of first resort of the United States when it comes to hostage rescue. Um, even though the United States works on these rescues all the time. So uh, back when Americans were taken hostage in the US embassy in Tehran in, in 1979, the uh, military worked around the clock to try to figure out a rescue mission. They launched a rescue mission, Operation Eagle Claw. It was a, an enormous failure, um, did not uh, get the Americans out. Helicopter crash, just, just total failure. But that failure led the path for the US military to form Joint Special Operations Command and US Special Operations Command, which houses several different special operations units in the US military, including a Delta Force from the Army and a Navy SEALs. Um, uh, so depending where in the world an American is kidnapped by a non-state group, the Navy SEALs and Delta Force have as one of their primary mission sets the rescue of Americans kidnapped abroad. And so they uh, work not only on recovering Americans taken captive without making concessions, without uh, rewarding our adversaries, they also punish our adversaries uh, quite physically in the process, uh, if you live to tell the tale. So these missions are, are uh, sometimes successful, sometimes not, um, but they're not the option of first resort because they a hostage recovery mission represents the most dangerous time in captivity for a hostage. During a rescue is the most likely time for a hostage to die because the kidnappers hear the helicopters coming and they uh, shoot the hostage or, or something like that, or, or there's a real risk in the crossfire. These missions also require a tremendous amount of intelligence. Um, they're very expensive, lots of training. And so the special forces are working on figuring these out all the time, but, but they're really more of a, of a last resort. However, uh, that said, I, I understand the, the urge to kind of have a, an analogous um, approach in the state-based hostage taking system, right? Um, if this deterrence by punishment works, if we show you that what happens when you take an American hostage is we send in the SEALs to rescue the hostage and to kill everyone involved, that's gonna be a pretty effective deterrent. Obviously, that's a, a really big problem when we're talking about international uh, actors, when we're, when we're talking about states. And so I think there's a real problem, both of escalation of, uh, you know, kind of acts of war that we're talking about um, that really make this quite dangerous. And so what do punishment mechanisms look like for the United States that aren't sending in the SEALs or Delta Force? Is there a way to punish our adversaries for this behavior that doesn't involve risking um, such a dangerous international incident? So that's what I'd like to see going forward. Okay, we've, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left here. So I'd like to kind of pivot back to, to the news cycle. So the Griner trial has gotten a lot of attention. Now it's been coupled with the case of Paul Whelan, who initially got a lot of attention, but then it's been quiet for a number of years. And I've had conversations with people up on the Hill. Senator Peters has advocated uh, on his behalf quite, um, quite regularly. But what, what explains the US media coverage of Americans kidnapped abroad? While some hostages receive national media attention, others hardly even make the local news. Mm -hmm. This is, um, as you know, a, a real interest of mine in my research because, because of that disparity of, of which cases get attention and, and which don't. Brittany Griner is arguably a celebrity, and so there's a lot of reason why, why her case may, gets a lot of attention. At a baseline level, we would expect hostages to get a lot of attention because of a phenomenon known as the collapse of compassion. The fact that the public is much more able to pay attention to a single named victim than a sea of unnamed victims. So in my research, I show, for example, that in hostage incidents where one American is kidnapped alone, they get substantially more media coverage than in a hostage-taking incident with multiple victims. It's kind of inversely uh, 
related to, to the number of victims. There's some other framing issues of the media that really shape whether or not these cases get attention. So when a kidnapping is referred to as terrorism or a kidnapper as a terrorist, that substantially drives the attention that the case receives. There are issues of race and gender. There's a phenomenon known as the missing white woman syndrome, which suggests that white female victims of abductions receive substantially more media attention than uh, equivalent people of color. And my research bears that out as well. Um, and then the last thing is this idea of the circumstances of capture. So Americans are less likely to feel sympathetic when they believe that the hostage put themselves in danger. They voluntarily traveled to a dangerous place. If they were arrested doing something that the American public thinks is questionable, those cases are a lot harder to sustain attention to. Well, Danny, Thank you so much. It's all the time we have for this afternoon. This has been a really enlightening conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to our guests on the line. Hope you also found this uh, this to be an enriching discussion. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. But Danny, I hope we can bring you back at some point soon to discuss this matter. The issue is not it's certainly not getting better looking at the trend lines. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.